Hello and welcome back. It's me again, Franz Cantor, cartoonist, illustrator, toon talker, teacher, tanker, tailor spy, and uh, movie aficionado. So I like my movies. I like my horror films. I like my cartoons. And I like my sci-fi. So today, I thought we'd do something a little bit different. I thought we'd do, instead of an actress, we'd do a, a, a role. So an actress, uh, Mila Jovovich, obviously, in character as the red-headed, uh, the red-haired um, Leela, Lilu, sorry, Lilu Dallas from The Fifth Element. So it's a really cool uh, film, and um, I hope that your this is very striking face, very incredible uh, expressions that she has in this film. She carries the film, even though it's you know Bruce Willis is in it and uh, a few other uh, great uh, actors and notables. Um, she basically, you know, the, the the camera really focuses on her a lot, and she holds that attention. She's quite a complex character. Sort of starts out as a sort of a blank slate. Her brain has been sort of just newly formed, so she kind of learns how to behave and how to um, feel as she goes along. Of course, in the end, of course, that's a pivotal part because she's the fifth element. So that's the, what the story is about. This is actually quite a, uh, an interesting scene. I love this scene. Um, this is what I call the Corbin Dallas multipass because uh, that's what that is. It's a multipass to go to uh, Flotsam uh, Paradise, I think. And uh, so she's, Corbin Dallas is played by Bruce Willis, of course. So she is playing his, pretending to be his wife. So she's like Lilu Dallas. Very, very striking features. You know, very, um, uh, very beautiful, very beautiful woman. Um, but again, you know, she's able to uh, hold her, hold your attention with these incredible expressions of intensity and a lot of it is emotion you can see this is a, a nice 1940s style even though it's color it's a 1940s style Dracula moment um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, the first time I saw this spotlight effect on the face where everything is dark was um, uh, Bella Lugosi in um, uh, Abin Costello meet Frankenstein Second time I saw this spotlight effect, of course, was Captain Kirk in the Enterprise in um, Star Trek. That's where they use this a lot. It focuses your intensity, focuses your attention on the intense moment of emotional impact in the character. And very, very effective. Um, you know, Luc Besson did a beautiful job. So, um, yeah, this is uh, the fifth element. Okay, so I thought uh, there's a, quite a range of photographs uh, that I thought we could I could draw. I don't want to sort of exaggerate her features too much because I'm I am quite sure that the most important thing with her uh, is her expression because she's just poured so much energy into that. So that's the photograph that I'm going to be using as reference. And we're going to be trying something a little bit different. I've, I've taken the opportunity to create a rough thumbnail, which is more cartoon than caricature, I feel. But that's going to give me a lot of um, leeway for the detail. So, you know, if you know anything about my take on caricature, it's basically that... Caricature is, in essence, a way of exaggerating and simplifying. So simplifying into a basic shape like this, right, to try to keep something elegant. So elegant, to me, I read this as long. So that's what I'm doing. I want her to be elegant. I want her to have a long face. 
and the features nicely placed apart, right? And a beautiful long hair, longish hair, and tiny body, right? Which we're going to do. That's what that's what I've decided I'm going to work on. Um, I don't want to exaggerate any of the features. She has got quite a, a beautiful shape to her nose, which we may we may decide to play up, but we've got to be sort of careful with uh, the amount of exaggeration that we put in, because then it sort of takes the attention away from her stare. And her stare, look at that. You can't get away from that. That's very, very important. So we need to highlight that. The other consideration is the lighting is quite even, but it seems to be uh, favoring the top right-hand side of the image. And, of course, that means that the other end, the other side of the equation would be, the other side of the object would be in shadow. So if I was to create a, a very quick shape here and spotlight it, of course, you would get shadows that form on the left hand side of the face okay so obviously when we prepare the features we put in the nose etc you will be looking at putting shadows that favor that main light source we may pick up some reflected light we may discover some or we may put in some reflected light um, artificially that's up to us if if we decide to do that of course you know, it just adds more three-dimensional properties to the drawing. So that just means that, uh, you know, your light, your shadow area has a compensating uh, fill light to uh, uh, lessen the intensity of the shadows. Because we're not after a film noir effect, which is a, a very high contrast drawing. We're after a a, we're going to build up our contrast, we're going to keep control of it, but mainly it'll be a tonal exercise, a tonal drawing. Okay, so the recognition factor for all drawings for, of the face, of course, is you focus the attention on the eyes and the nose and the mouth. So those are the features that we need to have some form of relationship with even though we can change the proportions and the size and the scale of these elements, they all have to be in relation to one another, not separate. So you have to look at drawing, at look at exaggerating the shape of those elements in concert with each other. So it always has to have some reference, some form of dialogue between those those elements. All right. Another thing in consideration to consider is because we're drawing a three-quarter view of the face, which is quite an extreme three-quarter, which is like this. Uh, let's get it in the right position, France. So this is the center line of the face, obviously, and it's going to be in perspective. So we need to think about perspective, how we line elements up that are receding away from us. So if there was a vanishing point somewhere over there, of course, there would be these lines that lead the, uh, the, the all of the linear qualities of the face would, would point towards a vanishing point on the horizon. Okay, so that's the front part of the face, because the front part of the face, let's draw this. There's the side of the head, there's the front part of the face, right? So the front part of the face is facing away from us. This edge here is facing towards us. So this actually affects, um, is a, sorry, this actually is created uh, uh, a three-dimensional, the three-dimensional view of this is created by perspective. So these, these lines here converge to a vanishing point there on the left. All right. Okay, so I've taken the this uh, rough thumbnail idea and I've kind of expanded upon it and drawn it, trying to keep it as light as I can. I, if I have time, I'm going to try to fix. I'm going to try to do something quite dramatic with the hair. So, so wait for that. All right, let's get into it now and see what we can discover here. There's quite a lot of uh, puffiness in her. Um, in the flesh above her eyes, 
which is uh, very, it seems to be very distinctive. So that's having an effect of pushing the eyebrows up, making them very arched indeed. Also, she has a sort of an over, looks almost like an over manicured eyebrow line for this, which seems, it actually fits perfectly to the character because we're not sure the character is reconstituted from a, uh, a burnt out, it's like a reconstituted DNA. So, you know, some elements of her that, that's sort of missing. One of the elements, of course, is her memory. So it's a very interesting story. Um, I love science fiction because of the amount of creativity that goes in at the design of the costumes and the characters and things. I love the, pra the practical aspect of it as well. So there's, there is CGI. There's a lot of CGI in it. I think 1999 the film came out. So there is CGI in it, but it's not overly, uh, it's not overly done. So it's not distracting. Uh, a lot of early CGI, of course, is incredibly distracting. It's it's like you know early stop motion animation. It can the process itself is so visible, can take you out of the film, uh, out of the narrative. Uh, one example is that the novelty of say, Pixar's first short film, Tin Toy, right? The tin toy worked really well, but the baby was very creepy because um, you know it was trying something that it technologically couldn't achieve, couldn't pull off, which was you know a realistic child. So um, the design of the fifth element. Uh, this is a Jodorowsky story, I think, which is one of the collaborators. If you read heavy metal one of the collaborators of the great Jean Girard, Mobius. And I think um, you can tell, you know, it's a sort of a Mobius-esque tale. Mobius-esque? Mobius-esque. <laughs> Mobius-esque. It's a sort of a Mobius-esque tale in a way, you know. So it's very, um, very detailed and it's... You know, Mobius has this brilliant quality of being able to create an environment, a world. Like he builds worlds like Miyazaki, you know, with details and things, little things you never would have thought about. I remember reading Arzak and uh, Airtight Garage, which is from the Metal Herland or Heavy Metal. Uh, if you're interested, you should uh, Pinterest it or Google it. To try to get some images of it you probably get some back copies perhaps from eBay um, well worth investigating because there were incredibly interesting tales back in the 70s there were comics beautiful comics so I quite I love this I'm, I'm presenting a perspective I don't know if you can see it from there I've got this sort of angle away down here. So I'm going to complement that by having the angle of the lips point that way. Ha ha! So it's kind of a, an affected cheat. But I'm, it, it, what it is is going to allow me to allude to a vanishing point. I'm going to pretend, you know, that there's a vanishing point, which I think will be kind of fun. Now, she's got a lot of makeup here, a lot of mascara which is hiding her features a little bit. Eye makeup is intended um, to enhance features, to expand them, or to create a larger-than-life effect. So mascara around the eyes hide a lot of the geometry. So you've got to sort of take that on board when you're drawing something like this. You've got to sort of keep that in mind, right? So what you need to look for is the eye under the makeup. That's what you need to think about. You need to look at that and try to sort of discover it. This is a brown pencil. This is a Rembrandt, uh, which is um, um, 
I can't remember what the, I, I can't remember what their, their names are. You can get these at um, Officeworks, I believe. So it's a reddish sort of terracotta, and I'm trying to achieve a tonal drawing. So I'll be using brown pencil, black pencil, and white pencil on toned paper. This is a Strathmore grey. It's a warm grey paper pad, quite thick. I think it's 260 GSM paper. So, and the good thing about it is it's called a multimedia paper, which is kind of handy because, you know, we, we tend to give the paper a bit of a beating, you know, rubbing out the lines we, we're not sure about and going over and over and over them and also hitting it with a bit of ink and paint and watercolor and things, multimedia stuff. So this is a multimedia material, multimedia paper. So that's going to be handy for us because I'm going to try to color her hair. Even though she's, this is a pencil, I wasn't going to do this. I was not going to do this at all. And believe me, I'm not convinced that it will work. I don't know if it will work. It may be a terrible mistake. We may ruin it completely. I don't know how we're going to fix it if it doesn't work. Um, there's no way to fix it at all. This, there's no undo's, you know, uh, analog, hello. There's no undo button here. Is you know, there's no unlimited undo like Photoshop. So we're kind of stuck with whatever decision we make. All right, so, um, so far so good. Let's try to get some definition in her hair. Now her hair is like a, a, a brilliant mess she, and it's got like a, it's orangey red. Um, it's, it's, it's actually brilliant. If, if you get a chance to see this on a big TV, I saw this in the cinema and I was blown out by her hair uh, more than anything else. Uh, her acting was good, you know. I mean, it, I'm not saying that that's the best thing about her. The best thing about Mila Jovovich is her hair. Um, but it is iconic. You cannot deny that. It's really, really iconic. I've never seen anyone with this sort of um, this color before. It's really vivid. And, uh, you know, it changes the palette, the color palette of the frames of the film. Whenever she's in it, she dominates. So it's the whole thing about her. Her acting dominates the film. Bruce Willis is beautifully understated as Corbin Dallas, and um, he does a he does a great role. He has a great he plays himself basically. I feel, and you know every role that he that he takes on, and it works because um, you know sometimes you just don't you don't want somebody taking the spotlight. Sometimes you want the you know, the premise, the story to shine out without uh, the actor's um, conscious involvement. Shall I put it that way? His, his conscious involvement. So um, I'm not counting her hair. Her hair is here. I'm just sort of giving a rough indication of the shapes uh, I'm not going in a lot of detail. Of course, I want to concentrate the detail in the facial features themselves, if that makes sense. It's a little bit of twisting in her hair and another strand over here, which is sort of overlaid. Let's try to get some, blow up some curls happening here. I have to get uh, keep in mind the the shadows, the shading, and I have to keep in mind the roughly the number of strands. Um, I, I can't. I don't have time to count them, um, so I'm just going to guess. But you know, it's something that uh, I have to keep control of to a certain extent. Yeah. 
so some of this hair down here because she's got a larger head because she's a caricature you know which is like what they used to term balloon heads because the heads were blown up bigger than the body um so you have to make you have to make allowances for that construction that change in proportions when you're drawing a lot of these elements they don't they no longer are they no longer have a place <laughs> so you've got to force the placement of a lot of this stuff so i've moved her ear and things like that to to create a sense a dynamic sense of uh, balance here and there so I am going to lose some of the these details I think is inevitable because I'm I can't I can't count them. I don't have the time. So I'm just getting impressions, you know, some tousled tufts, tufts, tufts of hair, uh, which is nice. How beautiful the pencil is in capturing the lengths, the strokes of hair, you know, the, the movement of hair does it so well. So I want to just simplify a lot of these shapes. I want her ear in there, obviously. It's actually, I don't think her ear is in the photograph. Um, but I'm going to put it in anyway. Because I kind of like it. It kind of looks a bit elfin, you know. So I'm going to leave it. Even if it's not there, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, this is a... This is my version of the character. So I really enjoy doing hair um, with a pencil. I can make nice long strokes like this, which is harder for me to do in Photoshop. But so get some shadows, build some details, get some shadows inside the hair itself to create a sense of depth. Now, she's got a thin neck because of the caricature, but I still need to shade it properly and to have some sense of correct anatomy. So, put in her shoulder blades or her the beginning of a sternum, whatever these these marks. Oh, I've actually, you know, I put the shadow on the wrong thing. So I remember that shadow, right? So that's you must think about that and act appropriately. See, I already broke the rule. I put the shadow on the wrong side of the of the of the sternum of the of the collarbone. Right. Simplify. And exaggerate so that's the order of the day I think let's try to get this in once we get this in we'll break its back uh, figuratively speaking of course um, we'll get most of the details that we want to use okay oh. What's happening there okay we'll do that that'll, that'll do that's fine I'll put in a few planets in here I might do a black background might be quite interesting um, just for the hell of it put a little name ribbon in here a little flourish that I think helps lock it and give it a more of a decorative pictorial feel quite like that I love the the intensity of the stare all right, so I've got a black pencil and I'm going to go in and put in the darkest points, which I reckon would be the pupils of the eye in a situation like that. Now she's got quite light eyes, quite light green eyes, intense green. So be careful with outlining the iris because it may be 
too stark, too strong. But then again, you know, there's the eye itself, which you've got to establish the folds with enough detail in the shadows. You see how I'm this building going back over the brow now, and I'm just adding in detail where I want it. And if I need a, a like a outline, it will just help the brown darken a little bit, you know, to create a dramatic contrast, a dramatic difference. Okay, all right, now we'll go into the eyelashes. I think what I might do is come back here with a black pen in a second once I establish this position because I think the black pencil over the brown pencil is not going to achieve its full contrast ability. This is that little bump that I had in mind when I picked this photograph. I really like this nose. It's very beautiful, very beautiful nose. It's got a bit of uh, character to it, you know, which is um, very interesting when you're drawing. You need challenges. You need to be draw you need to be drawn into a dialogue of lines and it's part of the fun. So think about even though you know things might be hidden in the dark of the photograph, you know always think about the geometry or not the geometry, the um, anatomy of the face and um, and just have and uh, reference it appropriately. So, if something needs it, will f you feel like you need to put in something? Don't hesitate. Just put it in, right? So, if you need to put in a uh, a lower lid, like a muscle around the bottom of the lid. Remember the eye. I I'm, I haven't got a, a full thing here, but the eye has this sort of ring of muscles around it. So it's not just fat or skin. It's actually a functional lens which con contracts and expands to let light in. So it forces the eye itself to close. And it also is experienced uh, in telling the story of the face. So the emotional impact. So we're very complex characters. Humans are so incredibly complex. The way that we communicate uh, visually, you know, more than any other animal. There's no animal that's quite like this. You know, no apes or possums or anything that has a level of um, ability to create, uh, ability to communicate emotions and thoughts with our face. So it's a really intense... Um, process of drawing um, someone especially an actress who you know like this has a, a gift of um, subtle communication uh, using her face to communicate very powerful emotions which is a hallmark of a lot of films like horror films and science fiction films because, you know, it's a, a story that we're not familiar with. So you've got to be held in place to listen to the rest of the tale. So um, the way they do that, of course, is with their, their intensity, their, their um, acting ability, performance. That's what the word I was looking for. Their performance. She's got a very, she has a very pouty, um, very pouty look here, which I think is good. I can try to extenuate that or expand on that a little bit, not too much. Don't want to sort of go overboard. Uh, again, making allowances for where things have, have moved in terms of their uh, positioning and relevance in the in the drawing because it is a caricature so I am moving things around 
So I need to uh, have a think about their, where they've moved to and where I can catch up and put in the details that's needed. That's another thing, you know, because um, I have moved elements around, because it is a caricature, um, a lot of the details have moved. A lot of the position of smaller details have moved. So you've got to sort of compensate for that and make allowances for it. That's, that can be a bit challenging sometimes, you know. It depends on how inventive you are with... Uh, with you know your ideas or, or the way that you uh, tackle the the problem or the challenge, so it can be uh, a bit sort of daunting. There's a lovely shadow on this side of her hair, which um, I hope I ne I don't lose that with the process. Some nice. Um, I don't want to outline every stroke of the red hair because I will be going over it with some. I hope with some ink, uh, this being a multimedia paper, I think it might be able to handle a bit of color. I don't usually color, um, you know, drawings as such. I mean, it's it's reddish, isn't it, with the brown ink, the uh, brown um, pencil. So, um, but I, I think I might try to. Oh, I've done a mistake there. It doesn't matter. That strand is supposed to be over that one. So, pay attention. So, as I said to you before, hair is fantastic to draw with uh, pencil because you can get this subtle, uh, long, beautiful s strokes representing strands and tufts of hair, tresses of hair. And um, the pencil can explain the texture really quite well. It's good fun. All right. It's a beautiful day outside, but. Uh, I don't know where you're viewing your world from. I always, I like to draw. I, I, I can't help myself. I really like it. And, um, you know, you should try to experience this with me because I'd love you to do that and pick up a pencil and and just play. Don't be so hard on yourself if you don't get a likeness. That's not important. The important thing is the drawing. The important thing is, you know, the experience of drawing itself. It's very bizarre. It's very strange because animals don't draw. And a lot of people, you know, when they're presented with the problem of drawing, they say they can't draw for some reason or they haven't drawn in years or something like that. You know, and it's really up to you to push yourself because we all fear the unknown and yeah, drawing is is one of those things but you know um, drawing leads to painting drawing leads to a lot of things sculpture architecture film animation so it's a lot of um, it's the starting point for a lot of uh, different forms of expression and uh, you know and it's a lot of fun it's fun. If it wasn't fun, you think I'd be sitting here doing it? I'd be out there enjoying the sun. But this is more fun. So, you know, the um, method of drawing that I that I like, uh, that I found over the past few years, past couple of years actually, nothing to do with the end result, like the full color illustrations, but. It's a beautiful contemplative way of creating structure and and a form, and it has um, evidence that you know Da Vinci and and maybe even the cave painters in Europe um, used. They didn't use white paper, pencil on white paper. They used a tonal 
They drew tonally like this with three colours. And we'll be approximating that method. So instead of using chalk, we're using white pencil, colour pencil. So we're not using a graphite based pencil, we're using colour pencils. The black is a colour pencil, the brown is a colour pencil, and the white's a colour pencil. So there's all different kinds of brands, I won't go into all of them, but um, this one here is a polychromo, which is a harder wax based uh, pencil, rather, it's not a you know, graphite pencil. There's also white. Uh, this is a Prismacolor, which is a softer pencil. It's a softer, so it has good coverage. We'll look at that in a sec. The brown, of course, is another, well, I think it was a Rembrandt. A Lyra or something. But there's also Prismacolors, which are, are um, they're quite soft too, the brown ones. And they're all sort of earthy colours. Like I pick colours that have a clay sound. You know, this is terracotta, I think. This is Tuscan red. Sounds more like a, a wine, but uh, it's a brownie. It's a reddish brown, so it's a warm brown. I wonder how we're going with this. Uh, Concerned a little bit with. I'm. I don't want to pay too much attention to how many strands of hair there are. I just want to try to get, get them down as quickly as I can. That'll do. It's a beautifully designed film. Um, when you look at it, it's the one thing that uh, stands out is the you know the, the level of uh, creativity they've gone into creating the monsters and the and the costumes and the environments and the details. You know, and as I said to you before, it looked very Mobius because um, you know. Luc Besson was channeling was was a loop it's a Jodorowsky story I think but I think he was kind of channeling Mobius I don't know if I can't remember I had the making of book but I can't remember if Mobius did designs I'm sure he would have he would have I mean it was in the same town after all um, so you know that makes sense to me actually because one of Mobius and Jodorowsky's um, novels, or, uh, graphic novels, is um, the Incal series. So this has a lot of similarities to that. And another film, I think, another comic, I think it was a. Um, Ridley Scott story or something, I don't know. Um, the Long Tomorrow, another sort of detective film, sci-fi detective film. Anyway, um, so this is, uh, get it? this has got a nice sort of uh, effect here. I think what I'll do is I'll use a white pen. This is a nice little touch. Um, so this is an opaque acrylic marker, so that will help establish some hierarchies with light to dark. Okay, so that's what we want to try to get, catch and make sure that this, you know, these hot spots, hot points remain hot or remain sort of bright in the tonal illustration. Alright, so there's a bit of lovely um, build up of texture around her cheek too up for highlights of you know quite broad, quite strong cheekbones. The other thing I just realized I've missed here is a little bit of shadow 
coming in from her fringe over her forehead so I need to sort of keep that in place as much as I can uh, maybe a little bit over there too remember that lights coming in from this way yeah so you know try to keep that in mind wouldn't go amiss to try a little bit of shadow even though the hair is quite close to the skin um, maybe a little bit maybe not maybe not maybe we've done too much be careful I don't want to take too much tension away you know sometimes less is more sometimes it's not important to be absolutely correct all right so uh, this paint white paint dries quite quickly which it has it's nice and what else can we do let's get in with a white pencil we've got brown pencil black pencil now the white pencil is to build up uh, tone so more highlights I don't know if this actually be careful with this because I have a feeling that the soft pencil reacts with water so if we're going to put watercolor over the hair I've made up some color already little dish of color over here which is nice right and that's made up of careful don't put it on the paper just in case it's wet at the bottom that's made up of these two colors now these are watercolors now watercolors come in different forms they come in pencil form which I'll give you an example of this is watercolor pencil on Albrecht Dura Faber Castell that's a watercolor pencil it comes in tablet form and it comes in mixed, pre-mixed with water. So this is distilled water that's mixed with the pigment. This color here is what they call sunrise pink. This one's pumpkin. This is from Dr. Martin's. And these are the colors that I've used for like 30 years. Um, radiant concentrated watercolor. First turned onto this by a friend of mine, Mark Salvofsky, a brilliant uh, artist, illustrator, who uh, used to use these in an airbrush and uh, I looked at them and got myself some and played with them um, and I found them to be very they're very satisfactory they're very good very very cool so I mixed those two colors to create a sort of a you know a, a burnt red a burnt orange so we're going to try to use that let's move it out of the way for the moment so it's somewhat some somewhat safe <laughs> Believe me, if it falls on, on you, you'll know it. Be very careful. A concentrated watercolor. I cannot say that word enough. Concentrated watercolor. So over here where we've got the, the hair, if we're going to put any highlights in there, you have to be careful. So I would use something that is not water, that is waterproof, that's not water soluble. So that's that's a good tip. I think that's a tip. That'll do. Now we don't want to highlight the hair too much because you know it is going to be orange after all hopefully if we have time um, so here we go maybe you know what I might do the orange uh, uh, at the last after the, the the background might be a dramatic a dramatic point so we turn the this film into having a dramatic moment how about that so why, do, why are we using the white pencil? We're using the white pencil to highlight form. Okay, so it creates a sense of form, a sculpture, if you will, that is lit by a spotlight. So it's, it's reacting to the spotlight, or you're referring to it, you're, you're actually drawing with light. That's what you're doing. So be under no um, illusion that it's a drawing it is uh, that it's not a drawing it is a drawing but it it is a drawing showing form so showing form so it's one of the the elements i think it's the third element of art form so there's line as shape which is the lines creating uh, an object uh, that has meaning and Form, of course, which is a three-dimensional property. 
which is created by light and shade, the presence of light and the absence of light. So light and shade interacting on the surface. There's also tone, which is how light and dark the form is, or how light and dark these objects are. And tone is contextual, of course, because you know an object in a dark room takes on a different tone than the same object in a well-lit room. That might, might sound terribly obvious to you, but um, it's something that you must keep in your mind when you draw. Otherwise, you will make a mistake. And that mistake will be a rookie mistake of colouring in rather than lighting. So I'm lighting with this. I'm not colouring in. So I'm only doing the light in response to the texture of the form that I'm drawing on and the amount of light and dark on that form. Okay, so there's also of consideration the texture which is the shininess or the matte quality of the surface of the text of the object. And uh, that is a very important element too because you know that the skin around the eyes is shiny because there's, there's a lot of moisture there or oil. It's also... Um, so here's an interesting dialogue just around the eyes itself, okay? So you've got skin here which catches the light. It bulges. She's got a, quite, a, quite a heavy brow, quite a bulgy brow, Frankenstein brow here. And she's got big beautiful cheekbones which also capture a lot of the light it catch, catches a lot of the light okay so we've got that element then you've got inside the eye itself the eye is wet okay so it's glisteny isn't it you've got the oils and things and the wetness around the skin of the eye so it's not just the eye it's around the eye as well which is also glossy so that also reflects light. So if it reflects light or catches light, it's going to be lighter than its surroundings. So you just go through and think before you leap. Think about those things. And you know you won't you won't you'll tend not to make a mistake because you you'll tread gingerly, won't you? You tread carefully on that area and don't jump in and assume just because the eye the white of the eye is called white of the eye don't immediately assume that it's white because remember if you make it white it's not going to look realistic because even though it's called white it's not white there's nothing white except maybe the sun you know and that's only from our experience So think about the textures and the, the way that the forms can capture the light itself. I'm using a sort of a hatch line method of building up the white rather than color, you know, streaking them, coloring them in. I think I might leave that gap there because I haven't, I haven't done exactly the same hair numbers and you know, tufts or tresses or whatever you want to call them as the reference. So I am losing a little bit of the ability to have the face show through the, um, the hair. So, you know, just when you're drawing it, look back at the reference and always refer back to something that can inform your decision on how light to make those elements, whether they're shiny, whether they catch the light, or some other consideration. You know, uh, skin also has a luminous uh, aspect about it. Sometimes it can be quite luminous, depending on the luminous. Is what's luminosity? Luminosity is. The light hitting the, the feature, hitting the skin, going
going under the skin if the skin is translucent enough and then bouncing back so it has a diffuse quality and it sort of lightens um, the skin texture giving it you know a very sort of uh, ethereal magical uh, look and that can that can happen to any skin type I believe any any color at all because it's um, to do with the uh, reflective and refractive not refraction that's glass reflective properties of skin and the the way that light can disperse yes dispersion under the skin and it has a very it can have quite dramatic effects you know make people look very luminous and and you know glowing that you know when you say to people oh you're glowing <laughs> that's sometimes they could actually be glowing quite literally you know um, or uh, they're not really glowing but they have that they kind of sort of look like it now she's got some um, freckles that I want to sort of put back into her face here to give it a little bit uh, more character Yeah, you put some over here for good measure. So skin is quite, um, quite an interesting organ. Very, you know, in many respects, very, very uh, complex. So you never sort of take it for granted. It has some very beautiful properties, indeed. All right, so let's try. We'll use another brush, a white brush. This time, we we'll use this one here, which is a pump action. So, should I get some paint down to the tip? There we go. Paint's in the, bar in the barrel, and it's again like that pen one. It's a brush. It's a uh, acrylic paint. I'm just adding a little bit of light to make it shiny if I can. Oh, that didn't work. Ah. Yeah, not too bad. That I'm trying to see the line around the nose, the, the reflected light. I'm trying to co uh, complement that with uh, a similar effect on that side of the face. I think it might be. It might work. Of course, it might not. Let's try to get some more reflective properties in the skin. It kind of works, so be careful with how much white you put in here. Kind of works. Okay, that'll do. Then let's try something with the brow, above the brow. Okay. Mm. So normally I would be thrilled with this, but I'm still quite concerned that I have I'm getting to the stage where I'm going to make a decision 
about the red or not. To red or not to red? That's the question. It's in my mind at the moment. Because um, once you make that decision, there's no going back, is there? All right, so let's... I would love to leave it like that, but... Um, so before I do that, we'll, tr we'll try and... Uh, I'm going to use another cup, another black pen, and colour in the sky and make it very dramatic as a contrasting uh, element to the um, to the hair and to the rest of the the drawing. So just cutting in around. Not so much fun this part, uh, but you know necessary I think to create a dramatic element to contrast the rest of the face. right up to the line that I've made with the pencil. I'm going to try to leave it a little bit uh, away from it. So it's got a nice uh, a double exposure type of effect. Okay. This uh, paint pen uh, Posca and they're beautiful pens because they dry flat, they're acrylic, so they won't actually go through the paper, which is a great thing, believe me. So you can get quite a lot of um, flat, nice flat, even color for the background. On the days when I used to use Indian ink with a pen and brush, uh, I used to cut in. Uh, it was a lot faster, but it would pool, and in the pooled parts of the ink, it would go shiny, which drove me absolutely up the wall. Um, because it sort of happened without any kind of warning whatsoever. You thought you were okay, but ooh, there's too much ink in that spot. And you didn't know, and lo and behold, gloss. So that was something that, um, obviously, working digitally, you don't have that, that uh, problem from the real world, from the analog world. So when these came out a few years ago, I only picked these up this year, um, I was really quite impressed by the technology or the, the thought that's gone into them. They kind of know you don't want them to pull, you don't want them to go through the paper. So there are other paint markers which I have here which you can get uh, that aren't Posca and I'll tell you they're not really worthwhile this is a uni chalk uh, have I tried this one? I think I have I think they're, they go glossy so same problem as Indian ink alright so so far so good we're nearly there right so what we might do is um, where's the watercolour brush I've got a watercolour brush here <laughs> well, it's got water in the handle, right? So it can push its way out and have a tissue ready so it can hopefully, hopefully, let's. Oh. I 
must be careful. Okay, so we're going to work because I'm right handed, we're going to work from the left down, and we may get lucky. But as I said to you before, it may go horribly wrong. Now, this paper that I'm working with, Strathmore, is not watercolor paper. It is, in effect, um, what they call multimedia paper, which can take a little bit of water. But you must not think that it will be a watercolor paper. It will not handle a lot of wetness. It will start to buckle and distort. And it may bleed through to the other side of the paper, which you don't want. So watercolor, we'll do another whole lesson on watercolor. Watercolor is a pigment that's suspended in water. And the way that you use it, the method of it, is to take your time, even though in many respect it dries faster than acrylic or oil, certainly. Um, take your time because you mustn't rush watercolor. It is not like other paint. Right? So you can't think of it like acrylic. You can't just slap it down. It's got to be prepared with a certain degree of restraint okay and the restraint is you build it up slowly you build up the intensity of color slowly don't go for the full color straight out of the out of the gate sort of gradually build up the intensity I can't see because of the shining of the light on what's happening over there the rest of the illustration um, it's too much reflection. So let's have a look at the monitor. Mm. Okay, so it's a bit sort of motley because it's it's wet after all, you know. So t it does take time to dry. I don't want to go too strong with this. I just want it to be nice and red, and that's it. Not, not, not overdone. That'll do. That's good. So far, so crap. <laughs> no, it's all right. It'll, it's, it's fine. I'm just. I'm careful. That's what I am. I'm careful. I want to be able to survive. I need to survive this process. Um, ooh, it's getting scary now. What's happening? No, it's all right. It's just wet. So she has got very intense hair, and I'm not capturing the same color because this is not this is not Photoshop, and it is not a watercolor painting. I am just helping the drawing out a little bit by delineate, not delineating, but uh, creating a, con uh, a, a a color effect. There you go. So it's not perfect color. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be a color effect over the drawing. So that's why the transparent watercolor is the nice a nice way to go oh, seems like I've mixed enough for the moment enough color um, I could go back in and intensify a lot of it but uh, if I do that it'll make darker deeper um, wetter paper and of course it would take longer to draw and I don't want to do that either.
wonder if I should, and you know what her, her um, straps, her overall straps are the same. So I better, I better do the same thing with that a little bit, as much as I can. Remember also, it's transparent watercolor and this paper is not white, it's gray. So the, the color intensity is going to be muted. It's going to be having a different effect tonally. Not tonally, but uh, in a color. So chromatically, it'll be different. All right, so let me go in now. there and let's see how we can move this out of the way somewhere over there it's nice and safe this is going to dry um, over about 15 minutes I would presume and um, you know but in the meantime uh, we're going to I'm put her name so Mila Jovovich character Lilu Dallas So that's going to take a little bit of time to dry um Let me tilt it up perhaps a little bit so that you can see that's what it's going to look like when it's dried. That doesn't look too bad. So let's have a look at the original. There's the original. And there's my caricature. And you can see I've, I think I've tried to keep the lightness there and a little bit of the elegance. But certainly I tried to uh, keep the intensity of her beautiful eyes. All right, this is Franz Cantor saying, I will catch you on the flip side. Bye bye. <laughs>